or even going to close these doors until the late arrivals that they're late and they should pay extra. Right, sir. Okay. Now we. But all right, I think that takes care of it. But, oh, one more thing, Sue, Sam. Yeah. It's uh, Merry Christmas from the college, and we hope that all of the college here's one for Sue. Uh, remember them in this holiday season. Smile. Sure. All right. We're here. All right. If uh, we have nothing further to announce, we will announce our speaker, Robert Hollum. Are we ready for you? Thanks for coming out to listen to me speak tonight. This is my eighth appearance before the College of Complexes. Those of you who are regulars, I think, probably know what to expect from me, and by the look of all the empty seats, I think the other people knew what to expect of me as well and stayed away. The title of my speech today is The Flight from the Sensorium. Almost no one recites poetry anymore, except maybe for the crackling obscenities heard at poetry slams. Insightful and felicitous use of language is not hard to find, though. You have to look in dusty books and history for it. Yet few of us now know how to decipher poetry. So as is my habit in these speeches, I want to begin with an epigraph, this time four stanzas, from an oft-quoted poem, The Ecstasy, from 1633, by the Elizabethan metaphysical poet John Donne. Some of you may appreciate this, others may not, but let me point out that poetry is meant for recitation, not for reading. On man, heaven's influence works not so, but first it imprints the air. For soul into soul may flow, though it to body first repair. As our blood labors to beget spirits, as like souls it can, because such fingers need to knit that subtle knot which makes us man. So pure lovers' souls descend to affections and to faculties which sense may reach and apprehend, else a great prince in prison lies. To our bodies turn we then, so that weak men on love revealed may look. Love's mysteries in souls do grow, but yet the body is his book. My thesis is that we live in a world of make-believe, of delusions and denial, divorced from the reality our senses deliver to us. We've taken flight from the sensorium, in fact, and now occupy a mental space or virtual reality where imagination, wish fulfillment, and ideation distort perception and enable abandonment of the body as the ground of experience. What is the sensorium exactly, for those of us unfamiliar with the term? The sensorium is the totality of those parts of the brain concerned with reception and interpretation of sensory stimuli, or more broadly, the entire sensory apparatus of the body and the mental impressions formed as a result. We are increasingly ignoring both sensation and the body, which is to say, our own embodied reality, and are living instead in our heads, or mind space, where abstraction soothes and smothers the senses. The earliest sensations of the body are in utero, where primal and complete fusion with the mother defines experience. The prenatal sense of oceanic unity with the environment of the womb is replaced abruptly after birth by discrepancies between the physical and social needs of the infant and available care and nurture. These discrepancies, demonstrated by the baby crying from the crib for food, create a deficiency state and a corresponding 
even overwhelming bodily urge to restore Eden. Psychoanalyst Michael Valen called this discontinuity the basic fault in his 1967 book of that name. In his book, Valen traced the origins of the basic fault to the early formative period, or more specifically, the emergence of the self culminating in roughly the third year of life. This may be more recon recognizable as the psychological theory of object relations, which describes how infants and toddlers manage the bewildering realization that they are unique selves or subjects as distinct from others or objects. Separation anxiety is typically felt by the child in the absence of the mother, and the teddy bear, imaginary friend, and security blanket are well-known transitional objects used to bridge the difference between self and other until boundaries are hardened and anxieties are quelled. The immersion metaphor, by the way, is not inconsequential since experience and identity are subsumed within context and environment and indeed merge with them. This is the earliest human orientation to reality, true of embryonic growth and our evolutionary history as a species. That unity and wholeness contrasts starkly with the divisive quality of inside the body versus outside the body, and interior thoughts versus exterior stimuli. Those divisions are learned in early childhood. The essentially oppositional nature of identity is initially understood in terms of the physical boundaries of the body, but eventually our sense of self ascends to the head and comes to rest in the mind with the formation of ego consciousness. This idea is expressed in the famous Cartesian, or Cartesian dictum, Cogito Ergo Sum, translated as, I think therefore I am, and was reinforced by Sigmund Freud's discovery of the unconscious and his three-part division of the psyche, namely the id, the ego, and the superego. Even the name Homo sapiens from the Linnaean taxonomy describes humans by a mental characteristic, wise man or rational man, rather than by a physical or anatomical attribute. Understanding ourselves first as thinking beings rather than embodied beings is still clearer in the negative cases of senility, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, all of which erode cognition and thus with it, identity. However, the centrality of the body and its senses to human experience cannot be overstated. It can only be forgotten or ignored. Let me provide a simple example. Babies are born with more neurons than they need, and as they learn something, say, a language beginning at about four months of age, the neurons not needed for that language simply die. The child can no longer hear or produce sounds used by other languages. Is it mere coincidence that for most of us, our first memories coincide with the formation of ego consciousness in the third or fourth year of life? Our inability to remember anything prior is somewhat controversially known as infant amnesia. Why does the ego block the memory systems of the body? I don't really have an answer for that question, except to observe that we have a combination of cultural and biological adaptations to the world. Culture evolves far more rapidly than biology, though there is increasing evidence of neuroplasticity or rewiring the brain in response to life experience. This places considerable emphasis on the present and forgetting of the past. Incidentally, I've been very interested in the idea of memory systems that function independent of the human mind, especially genetic memory and cultural memory. These aren't quite the same thing as history in my view. Genes and DNA are frequently cited as information encoding systems, and cultural memory is now a growing field of inquiry as researchers and anthropologists uncover what amounts to messages from the past to the future. In one example from recent news, ancestors of modern-day Japanese 
left behind stone markers, some more than 600 years old, warning not to build below certain positions along the coastlines. One such marker reads, High dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of the tsunamis. Do not build any homes below this point. Those markers were ignored, but rediscovered following the earthquake and tsunami in March of this year. I also read an extremely interesting blog post called Cognitive Archaeology of the West by Paula Hay, which examines the biblical legend of the fall, not as the story of Adam and Eve expelled from paradise for eating from the fruit for eating fruit from the tree of knowledge, but instead as a story of the loss of animism or liminal awareness or what anthropologist Richard Sorensen calls pre-conquest consciousness. The tree of knowledge is a metaphor for awareness, of course, or better yet, self-awareness, as evidenced by Adam and Eve's sudden realization and shame over their own nakedness. As with the Japanese markers, we lose track of cultural memories as stories become myths and then legends if they're not abandoned altogether, like the mythologies of ancient Greece and Rome, and the even older ones from Egypt, Babylonia, and Samaria. Stores of cultural memory, or stories, if you will, shed their meaning and significance to such a degree that we scarcely understand them anymore, which is one reason why living memory of the Civil War was so important throughout the early part of the 20th century, why living memory of the Holocaust is so important to us even now, and why we instruct ourselves to never forget, whether in reference to the Alamo or in reference to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. When cultural memory is erased, lost, or otherwise ignored, we suffer in ways we don't even recognize. Maybe somatic memory, knowledge formed and contained within the body, is not all lost as we develop from in infancy. Blogger, author, and philosopher Sandy Krolik, citing the phenomenological philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, suggests that, and I quote here, a memory trace remains embedded deep within the flesh of every human, a phylogenetic gift, if you will, present even within the symbolic systems we create, granting the possibility for episodic and periodic recovery of that primal integration at any moment. This feral memory calls us back to the chiasm, the pre-reflective intertwining of my body as subject and the world as lived by my body." End quote. Connection of the body to and with the world is present in the practice of shamanism still found today in indigenous cultures. The spirits shaman or shamans communicate with are not fictional beings or sky gods as found in Western religious practice, but are often animals, plants, and the elements found within this world in the immediate environment. The closest thing most Westerners have to a real connection with the sensorium is the sort of half-baked naturalism of an outdoor lifestyle, constituting hiking, fishing, and climbing, which succumbs quickly to the need to get a hot shower and a cooked meal, returning to the creature comforts that make us human again rather than the animals we in fact are. Turning back to the question of identity now raised to the level of society, the modern world of mass media, global communications, 24-7 connectivity, and information glut, all of which form what I've heard called technological zen, has caused the disappearance of community and national identity, leaving in their place whole societies characterized by rootlessness, loneliness, and atomization. Yet young people naively believe today is the best time ever to be alive. Cultural critic Ann Morris Berman, who I've quoted from in the past at length, <coughs> writes in his blog, and I quote here, people are now living in a virtual world, thinking they're part of a community, 
when technology has largely served to destroy community and thinking they have knowledge when all they have is a tsunami of information. End quote. Some even argue that technology has spawned a new phenotype, the mass man who lives not in, of, and for himself, but for images, icons, and ideals provided to him by the dominant culture of the day. In short, mass man has no sense of self apart from the commodities he consumes, the sports heroes and celebrities he worships, and the weak virtual associations of social networks. Put another way, mass man has sublimated, though imperfectly, the essential need of the body for meaningful connection and sociability. Freud wrote about suppression of human nature in his 1933 letter to Albert Einstein titled, Why War? And I quote, Modifications that go along with the process of civilization are striking and unambiguous. They consist in a progressive displacement of instinctual aims and a restriction of instinctual impulses. Sensations pleasurable to our ancestors have become indifferent or even intolerable to ourselves. There are organic grounds for the changes in our ethical and aesthetic ideals. Of the psychological characteristics of civilization, two appear to be the, the most important. A strengthening of intellect and an internalization of the aggressive impulses." End of quote. From this perspective, I find that the rather epigrammatic pronouncement by Marshall McLuhan that all violence is, in truth, a search for identity becomes a lot clearer. Another intellectual who recognized this striking sociological development was the Spanish existential philosopher and social theorist Jose Ortega y Gasset. He described the rise of mass man within mass culture in his 1932 book, The Revolt of the Masses, which argues how, in the early modern era, man, man abandoned himself to ideologies, especially the new culture of commodities, though without the benefit of actually understanding them. In short, we forgot our past and we forgot ourselves, or if you will, our selves. More significantly, because we felt inferior to our things, we began destroying ourselves, including our awareness of what we were doing. We acted out these impulses overtly during the first half of the 20th century with its two great wars, the great mechanical wars, and sublimated them in the second half with the Cold War and rapid technological advances that made individual human life subservient or irrelevant to our institutions, corporations, and to historical trends. We're all now treated in aggregate through collection of phone records, emails, internet browsing habits, and credit card transactions in what is being called big data, a surveillance system set up not by Big Brother or by some government agency, though they may exist as well, but by marketers and keepers of credit scores. A famous diagnosis of the changing social character in the middle of the 20th century appeared in David Reisman's famous book from 1950 called The Lonely Crowd. Reisman identified three basic social orientations, tradition, inner directedness, and outer or other directedness, whereby society imposes conformity on individuals through shame, guilt, and anxiety respectively. The current mood of society, in my view, is plainly high anxiety. Some of us may remember when business was were people friendly, but at some point employers started scamming customers and exploiting employees mercilessly. We also have ongoing reminders of terrorist threat levels and, and a social landscape changing so rapidly including with its increasingly strong generational divides, that we must constantly retrain ourselves in order to, main, to remain socially relevant. Tradition has little pull on us, 
and our inner lives are so weak that we seek fulfillment outside ourselves and suffer the existential anxiety of having no real moral compass to guide us other than what the public sphere provides. For a final example, spiritualist, monk, and mystic Thomas Merton describes modern man aptly in his posthumous 1974 book, New Seeds of Contemplation, and I quote here, I apologize for the length of this quote, but this is worthwhile, I think. The great temptation of modern man is not physical solitude, but immersion in the mass of other men. Not escape to the mountain or to the desert, but escape into the great formless sea of irresponsibility, which is the crowd. There is actually no more dangerous solitude than that of the man who is lost in a crowd, who does not know he is alone, and who does not function as a person in a community either. He does not face the risks of true solitude or its responsibilities, and at the same time, the multitude has taken all other responsibilities off his shoulders. Yet he is by no means free of care. He is burdened by the diffuse, anonymous anxiety, the nameless fears, the petty, itching lusts, and all the pervading hostilities which fill massed society the way water fills the ocean." End quote. While it might appear that the 20th century represents a psychological discontinuity of immense proportions, and I believe that it does in many respects, I also want to point out that the root cause is traceable to the subject-object distinction in classical Greek philosophy which in turn spawn self-other and mind-body dualisms. These abstract concepts underlie cognition for those of us socialized into a Western style of mind and contribute to the reification of modern consciousness. So ends the psychology and sociology lessons, although I could also envision in launching here into a philosophy lesson with special emphasis on the phenomenological and existential branches, Time, I feel, limits me and forces me to move on to other topics demanding consideration. I must also omit here a discussion of the sort of consciousness we left behind in the shift to modern consciousness. I mentioned liminality earlier, but we can only barely grasp its outlines, trained as we all are in Western-style thinking. Its foreignness and inscrutability are obvious, however, to anyone acquainted with descriptions of indigenous societies that survived into the last two centuries still unacquainted with Western thought. To illustrate how saturation in unconscious metaphors and hypotheses shapes our relationship to reality more significantly than does the body, I want to discuss another of our mental categories, namely clock time. The mechanical clock appeared in the 14th century and at the time of its invention had no minute hands. That development took another 300 years or so. Adam Frank discusses time as a cultural construct in his article Farewell to a Tick-Tock World, which is excerpted and adapted from his 2011 book About Time, Cosmology and Culture at the Twilight of the Big Bang. And I have another long quote here. The introduction of mechanical clocks shifted the organization of the European day and eventually provided a new metaphor for the heavens, a precise cosmic clockwork set in motion by God's hand. Centuries later, the introduction of steam power started the Industrial Revolution's new machine age and drove the rhythms of its workers' punch clock lives. The science of thermodynamics advanced a new understanding of time and transformation in terms of energy, entropy, and evolution, metaphors and conceptual tools that reshaped cosmological thinking. Then, just before the dawn of the 20th century, trains and telegraph wires created new experiences of simultaneity across vast distances. Einstein's theory of relativity used its own new vision of simultaneity as a pivot point for merging 
space and time into space-time. By the last decades of the 20th century, silicon technology dominated our material engagement with the world and moved at speeds so fast, the cadence was far more native to atoms than to humans." End quote. By way of comparison, the ancient Greeks had two words for time, chronos and keros. Chronos refers to chronological or sequential time, while keros signifies a time in between, a moment of indeterminate time in which something special happens, a defining moment or a turning point. If chronos is quantitative, kairos is qualitative. One might ask, a time in between what? The kairotic moment is difficult to apprehend, of course, since we understand time in the modern world almost wholly as clock time. But it relates to the connectedness of the body, to the sensorium, and the intersubjectivity, which is a term that Edmund Husserl learned, uh, uses in his phenomenological philosophy. The intersubjectivity of shared experience between people within a social system. To illustrate, I'd like to quote Sandy Krolik again, this time from his 2009 book, The Recovery of Ecstasy. My commitment to talk, clock time had been forged by some well-embedded cultural habits, but this relatively modern convention did not quite square with my pre-reflective experience of being in the world. And the forgery committed by linear time had a shared heritage with various other cultural systems, literacy, science, and history, effectively concealing my connection with the world as lived by my body. In order to recover and reclaim this primal bond, I had to allow the natural rhythms inscribed in and articulated through my sentient body and not the linear time or of my socialized, civilized ego to express themselves." End of quote. Most of us have at one time or another had the experience of flow, where time seems to dissolve and we experience unity with the object or activity of, our, of involvement. Sexual intercourse may be the most obvious example, but music making, reading, gardening, dining, and sports are further examples. Although most experience of flow is still understood in terms of self and other, some types of flow are better characterized in terms of loss of self, such as with meditation. The sense of music flowing through the musician rather than from him is another instance. Selflessness also represents an unexpected terror to ego consciousness, which some have called cosmic anonymity. Morris Berman comments on this in his 1989 book, Coming to Our Senses, and I quote, Situations of intense relatedness, romantic love, psychosis, mystical experience, involve a regression to syncretic sociability, where it is impossible to distinguish where self ends and other begins. We long for this, but, is the, but it is the ultimate horror as well, the collapse back into the abyss." End quote. Nevertheless, zoning in and losing oneself is deeply gratifying. Shredding clock time and recovering the primal bond are undeniably unified mind-body experiences we all crave. The tunnel vision experienced by video game enthusiasts is probably a badly misplaced attempt at recovery, since it in fact deepens investment in virtual reality, but it still points to a desire for immersive transcendent participation. Another example of misplaced emphasis appeared in the news earlier this week with the announcement of isolation of the Higgs boson, the so-called God particle, at the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. I think that the announcement of the discovery of the Higgs boson after they've been looking for it for so many years was probably just a 
publicity stunt to keep everybody focused on the the activity of the collider now that they've got it back up and running. But that's just my sense. Um, if you read the news reports very carefully, they say they may have glimpsed it, which is a pretty deep hedge as far as I'm concerned. Scientists and gamers may find beauty and transcendence in cosmology and first-person shooters, but those qualities are largely blocked by the rational mind and its adherence to scientific principles of measurement and empirical truth. We're similarly blocked from truly understanding other cultures that are mediated by different metaphors and cultural understandings of the world, though Western culture is now infiltrating everywhere. When Edward T. Hall introduced the idea of deep culture in the 1950s, namely that profound disparities exist in the attitudes of different cultures toward time, space, and relationships, the idea was heretical. Deep culture is now a well-established part of training for the Peace Corps and those fighting foreign wars, though the motivations may not be to join and share in foreign cultures, but to exploit and manipulate them better. If blockage of our bodily connection with the sensorium characterizes the modern world, and if in fact we are actively fleeing from the sensual experience to a virtual mind space, there are some few who still intuit and express the shift, namely artists. Who is still interested in art? My feeling is that everyone is still interested in art, at least everyone except for businessmen and technocrats. Whether artists are driving the flight from the sensorium or merely documenting and describing it, is impossible and irrelevant to establish. But I want to show that painting and music in particular have paralleled a gradual emptying of meaning in cultural and social life. Of course, I don't mean to suggest that nothing new or worthwhile has been created in the last two centuries or so. Rather, I want to suggest that artistic trends, if one can read them, point undeniably to a great hollowing that reflects our loss of connections between the mind and body and subsequent concentration on purely abstract categories. Painting and music both predate civilization by a large measure and may even predate language. Although it was not until the Renaissance that true perspective appeared in drawing, the remarkable expressivity of cave paintings in the upper Paleolithic era as much as 35,000 years ago is frequently interpreted in terms of man's dreamlike identification with other creatures he lived among. Werner Herzog's documentary film, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, adopts this interpretation and has startling and awe-inspiring visuals in 3D, of course, because we can always improve upon reality by applying technology. Fast forward to French Impressionism and Pointillism, as seen in the works of Claude Monet and Georges Seurat, one begins to see shallow preoccupation with techniques that so characterizes artistic movements and sensibilities to come. Traditional subjects of painting, still life, portraiture, and landscapes and seascapes eventually fragmented into cubism, as seen in the works of Marc Chagall and Pablo Picasso, just to name two more. Cubism broke apart reality to reveal a simultaneity of perspective. Dadaism, as found in the works of Max Ernst and Marcel Duchamp, made art absurd. And surrealism, found in the works of René Magritte and Salvador Dali, made it well, surreal. But the real emptying came with the abandonment of representation in abstract expressionism found in the works of, for example, Vasily Kandinsky and Jackson Pollock. Painting eventually abandoned almost everything in the form of minimalism, which raised to its perhaps absolute form is found in the work of Mark Rothko, whose paintings are simple, rectangular color fields. The success of painting, emptied of meaning and context, is paradoxical, 
for us in the modern world. They tap a reflexive search for meaning on the part of the viewer, which the viewer supplies by projecting his own idiosyncratic and unimpeachable interpretation onto the artwork. Subject is at last reunited with the object, but the experience is inherently hollow and false, like the sound of your own voice in an echo chamber. This is obvious to any casual observer who simply knows art when he sees it, which is to say that good art makes a visceral impression on his sensibilities. He need not be schooled to view art through a distortion lens, for example, the fame and reputation of the artist, the presumed cash value of the artwork, or another's authoritative interpretation. And yet who can argue that modern sensibility is not well expressed in modern painting? Does painting not, in fact, embody in many ways our flight from the senses as felt in and by the body and into a reality mediated by the mind and its metaphors? Music followed a similar line of development, especially art music, which is now populated and controlled by academics. The earliest forms of Western music still available to us spring from two sources, the rhythms of the body found in dance and the naturalness of singing found in folk and liturgical music. The major minor harmonic system we take for granted did not actually coalesce until the late Renaissance, only slightly after perspective emerged in drawing. Harmony began to unravel in the works of Richard Wagner and Claude Debussy. At about the same time, Impressionism and Cubism appeared, namely in the late 19th century. Of course, dissonance and chromaticism in music are only possible within the context of harmony which was abandoned in the 1920s by Arnold Schoenberg and his disciples, Anton Webern and Alban Berg, in an abstract attempt to free pitch from the tyranny of harmony. The systemization of music using the 12-tone technique was an outright denial of artistic expression in favor of mechanization, or mechanization is the word. Was it a mere coincidence that the peak influence of Frederick Winslow Taylor's scientific management occurred in the same decade. Arbitrariness in musical structure was later expanded into serialism found in the works of Pierre Boulez and Karlheinz Stockhausen, which systematized not just pitch, but other musical elements as well. Raised to perhaps its highest form, the emptying of music was utterly complete with John Cage's infamous 1952 work, 4 minutes 33 seconds, which calls for three timed intervals of silence totaling 4 minutes and 33 seconds. <laughs> Cage's composition is more philosophy than music, I argue, and it argues, by example, that any kind of sound, including silence, may constitute music. The 1950s represent a developmental end point in painting and art music in the West, after which no clear aesthetic has yet been able to emerge. Concert halls and galleries, if their programming goes beyond the necrophilia of presenting again and again and again only masters from centuries ago, they offer for contemporary works, which is a form of neophilia as though engaged in a gigantic bluff with audiences, gambling that no one in the audience with the credibility to make an accusation stick will observe that the emperor is wearing no clothes. That naked truth is apparent to anyone who bothers to look, of course, except that we pay little heed to what our senses tell us anymore, nor to the few truth tellers and whistleblowers. Instead, we attend to marketers, politicians, and mainstream media, each of which serves up its own form of hucksterism to keep everyone gobsmacked by the latest gadget, danger, trend, or celebrity banality. Beyond the arts, the best example of our fundamental disconnect from the sensorium is the creation of the monetary system, 
While economics, finance, and money obviously have real power in modern life, they are nonetheless, like time, social constructs entirely devoid of intrinsic meaning. Their value lies in our collective agreement to value them, which is pretty much forced upon us from birth. <coughs> money has been losing value via inflation since the creation of the Federal Reserve, and worse, abandonment of the gold standard in 1971 was a flat-out admission that the dollar is in fact a fiat currency, not that this admission represented much more than a momentary shock. Real credible wealth has long since given way to putative or notional wealth as measured by a stew of deposits, mortgages, bonds, stocks, electronically traded funds, options, futures, credit default swaps, but most of all, by sovereign debt. So much money has been loaned into existence that NPR recently reported a stack of $1 bills representing $14.3 trillion in U.S. debt would be equivalent to the distance to the moon and back twice. Politics has long been regarded as a stage act or a kind of theater, while real government is operated behind the scenes by the military-industrial complex. This is reflected even in the dissent and demonstration against government by the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street movements, which are criticized for being about nothing due to their inability to articulate clear demands. I think that they're a perfect embodiment of the hollowness of modern life, and they express it through their bodies by their physical presence in Zuccotti Park, at the mall in Washington, and elsewhere. It's all a bad joke, of course, though dissenters are so confused that they probably don't get that they are the joke. Jerry Seinfeld got the joke early on and made a TV sitcom about nothing. He got plenty of laughs out of holding the mirror to our faces and showing us what shallow, despicable people we've become, which was revealed in the final episode when all the main characters ended up with prison sentences. The show was basically soft-cell misanthropy in comic form. Perhaps the very worst instantiation of the virtual world we occupy is our electronic gadgets and software. We have unwittingly created a power complex where the rise of group behavior and aggregation, big data again, allows for anonymity. Within the crowd, indivi individual people are in fact not wanted, and we have complied by no longer being real people. Rather, we're avatars and email addresses, bloggers and Twitterers, virtual friends and consumers without flesh and bone presence among each other. Even when we are in what they call meat world, we're still checked out, monitoring our gadgets more closely than our social interactions, adopting a sort of absent presence or mobile isolation, if you will, which is tantamount to living inside a tech bubble. Following Steve Jobs' death, an ABC News article described his mantra as rooted in Buddhism, and I quote, Jobs made computers and handheld devices that have allowed people to become disembodied on a certain level, to escape and transcend the mundane reality of bodily existence. Now somebody was writing about him like he was a tech guru and a visionary and a, a man to be admired, but I wonder what is so mundane about reality? What is so offensive about bodily existence? Why do we need to escape it, and why is he lionized and celebrated for enabling us? Whereas he was supposedly an important somebody, he enabled us to feign escape from our bodies and be nobodies. Perhaps it was fitting, then, that outside Apple stores around the country, mourners were seen holding their iPhones and iPads aloft, displaying virtual candles. <laughs> in conclusion, the development of the modern world is an extremely complicated history, so complex that even professional historians who typically specialize in one area and one time have trouble getting it right. 
I've tried to demonstrate that a signal development, the division of subject from object in antiquity, and su the subsequent separation of self from other and mind from body, have had profound structural effects on Western consciousness. I also assert that with astonishing acceleration during the last two centuries, we have lost touch with our embodied nature and now focus instead on the ideas, arts, and technologies we created. The result of this transfer of attention has been catastrophic. Centuries ago, we imagined a, an objective and lifeless world, free for us to dominate, exploit, and destroy at, world, at will. We also imagined ourselves independent of that world, not part of it, not positioned within it. In the 20th century, we sank to behaviors so vile, so horrific, and so destructive, it was incumbent upon us to objectify and destroy human nature as well. So we took flight from the sensorium and now live through mental projections as if within a hologram. Technology and demographics now mediate experience so completely that the great unwashed masses have become anonymous ciphers, barely even real people anymore. And we would be unrecognizable to our forebears. Further, the disappearance of people-oriented businesses and meaningful social activity is a hallmark of a hollow, superficial, narcissistic society dispossessed of inherent value. People exist within two contexts, individually and in groups. We struggle between the two as a necessary part of our existence because we are first individuals with distinct bodies though they be bodies with highly developed, perhaps even overdeveloped nervous systems, which allow us to ignore sensation by overthinking everything. And second is groups, because we're social animals, keenly attuned to everyone else, at least until we disengage and attend to our machines instead, which is nearly all the time now. Being alive, we should be innately aware of our bodies and our surroundings, like other animals, but we're not. We have only limited awareness of either one, and we are determined to remain unaware. Here, cultural memory and society have failed us. I have one final quote. This one is about loss by the English author and playwright Anthony Burgess, who was speaking through his fictional character Enderby, about how his readership would decline as his illusions were eventually forgotten. The past spat upon us, and the future was ready to be spat upon, since this would quickly enough turn itself into the past. to Doctor Who and the TARDIS, and the, the, the significance of that escaped me. I didn't say anything about either either thing. I don't recognize either of those references. I misunderstood. <laughs> yes, uh, turn it up. Right now I feel that I have a body and a mind. <laughs> if I didn't have that distinction, then do I just, every time I'm hungry, I just eat. Anytime I want to have sex, I just grab the, ne the nearest male, do it, live unrestrained, I, I'm hungry now, I want to sleep now, I want to eat, I, I want to have sex now, and, and just, I mean, to me, if I just listen to my body and only do what I want, what separates me from my animals, you know, from animals, or that. What should separate you from the animals? We are animals. But I have restraint or discipline. Right. We we have minds that are that are present in animals in only um, partial form compared to us, at least. So, if you're asking me what my recommendation is, do you respond solely to instinct, which is 
the body and its biological program, or do you also listen, or do you mostly listen to the mind? I would say we need to be unified. We have to recognize that we are our bodies, that, it's, that the self is not the mind. And we have to honor the body at the same time that we restrain ourselves through judicious action. But we should restrain ourselves because why? I mean, why? Because we live within a social context and we have obligations and responsibilities. Yes, Tony. Uh, thanks for your talk. I was wondering why you did not mention the role of capitalism in the way our consciousness is formed. The alienation, the disembodiment, and, uh, and the other things that affect the self. Uh, it seemed to me that that is an essential, vital part in our view of society and, uh, and, uh, and our future. Well, I did mention the monetary system, and I know that that's not capitalism, but they, they intersect each other, obviously. Um, when I'm preparing the speech, of course, I have to decide what I'm going to put in and what I'm going to leave out and what time allows, and I had judged that, that time did not allow that. And besides, I gave a speech 14 months ago about the liberal democratic impulse that examined the idea of proto-capitalism, so I didn't want to re repeat myself in that respect. The question is whether capitalism has an essential role underlying our thinking, and of course I do believe that. I, I think it's one of our um, metaphors and ways of judging our behaviors in the world, but I think it's a faulty one, especially because it has turned out to be so corrupt. War and propaganda. Isn't that a manifestation of a capitalist state? And the way we are, uh, our role in the society? It, that falls a little outside of the scope of my thesis, but yes, I, I believe that um, capitalism is a um, program of gathering resources, which sometimes begets conflict, including war. Has anything good come out of the death of the sensorum as you see it, or are we headed down a long road to perdition? I'm a pessimist. My glass is half empty. So, shall I ring from my assessment some silver lining in order to satisfy the, the hopeful positive ending that many people possess? Uh, I, I could potentially do that, but it doesn't correspond to the way I actually feel about the issue. Yeah, Bob, you're all over the place about forgetting the past and some... Are you positing there's some... This thing... I can bring the change. Like the no. collective consciousness that's passed on, like Lamarckian okay. thoughts are passed on to subsequent generations. And where are you headed in that direction? We, we begin tabula rasa. We don't pass on memories of 9 11 to the next generation. I'm familiar with the, um, the idea of Lamarckianism, that the experience of the, the, the parent in life, as opposed to the, the genetic material of the parent, passes on to the child. And no, I don't subscribe to that, nor do I subscribe to the idea of a collective consciousness, or, or the force, if you have seen Star Wars, and who hasn't by now. Uh, however, I... Carol Young. I do believe that um, because we live within a, a social context that the um, ideas and the metaphors and the hypotheses and, and the symbols that we use are so broadly distributed and so unconsciously powerful that we find it inescapable but to adopt many of the dictates of, of Western mentality. 
I've heard that um, that whole collection of ideas referred to as the curriculum of the West. And one of those, one of the pieces of that curriculum is capitalism. Um, when you were talking about the mass man, um, I'm not familiar with either of those people that you had mentioned that had brought up that issue in their writings. Um, but when you were describing it, it sounded a little bit to me like Marcuse's one dimensional man. I was wondering if you had read any of Marcuse, if you could give me a little clear contrast so I could understand the idea a little bit better. I'm not familiar enough with Marcuse to, to do the comparison contrast, but there are many, many. Uh, social theorists from the early and middle part of the 20th century, including Marcuse and um, Ortega y Gasset was the one that I mentioned. Uh, their Reisman is justifiably famous is the other one that I cited. And, and they all look at man in aggregate as opposed to man as individual because as social beings we do behave like a like a hive, if you will, not not exactly like an insect colony, but but we we share much more than we have separate from each other. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about the not, about the conflicts the conflict between yin and yang, or male and female, and that the female. Like, the joke in my mind has always been that when you see a western and you see wooden plank sidewalks, it wasn't the guys that thought this was a good idea and put them there. It was the ladies that made them do it. And the domestication of people, you know, is like, you know, the the weak shall inherit the earth. It's the feminization of civilization as it moves on in time. Can, can you comment on any of those thoughts so I can better understand here? I don't want to simply concoct an answer. Um, the world we live in, of course, is full of a variety of conflicting influences, and I think that the, the typical characterization of the male and the female, the yin and the yang, is, is one of nurture versus conflict. One of um, competition versus cooperation, right? So, depending on what the style of social organization uh, may be anywhere across the globe, whether it's pastoralism or, or industrialism or tribalism or who knows what, there are different... Um, adaptations that fit that style of social organization that are promoted because they're more successful. I don't want to say it's Darwinian, but I think you can gather that in the United States, for example, ruthless business competition is rewarded because it's successful, and that cooperation between businesses is not so successful because somebody else is going to come in and exploit and, and scam you if you're not vigilant. Um, people have been pointing to hunter-gatherer culture as being more cooperative and more egalitarian than anything that has followed in the various civilizations since that time. And I'm not sure that we can establish that um, irrefutably. I think it's peering a little too far back into history and projecting our ideals and, and wishes upon them. But I, I suspect that there is some some truth to the to the matter as well is that when you didn't have static um, hierarchical organizations then you had no one with power and force over you that we were all more free hi uh, I got two brief questions For one could you tell us again um, it might help us to understand what is your uh, you know work background? What do you do for a living? And uh, the question, the second part is, do you have you given this talk to uh, audiences with different educational backgrounds? Uh, what what's your motivation for giving this presentation uh, here? And you know how do you think it helps us? 
I've often had this question, what makes you an expert on the thing you're talking about? And, and of course, I don't have the kind of credentials in anthropology, sociology, psychology, philosophy, or anything else that would allow me to appeal to my own authority. Instead, I'm a musician by training, but I'm a, I'm a polymath, I'm a self-educated autodidact, and I had a thesis, like all of the other speeches that I've given here, and I researched and collected my evidence. Some might accuse me of cherry-picking, but I think we all are um, prone to a little confirmation bias, if you will. But, um, yeah, I, I came up with the idea that, as I said, this is my eighth speech up here in front of the college, and no, I haven't given this speech anywhere else to other audiences of other, um, what, educational attainment. This is the first audience that heard this speech. Yes, I just finished it today. Uh, I just wonder what the reaction was from other people in different places if you had given them before. What you see is what you get. They, they threw them out. Yes, uh, following up on Karina's question, uh, here at the college, we embrace sensory experiences as we gorge ourselves on whatever we eat and as we mutually engage each other. Is that sufficient to negate our flight from the sensorium? Or is it a continuous thing? I've used the word social context repeatedly, and, and it's important to me to reinforce it again and again because everything that we do is within a social context. So can we negate our social context or overcome it? I'm not all that convinced because the the things that we share are part of our experience and you can't extract or, or isolate yourself from all that shared experience. Um, I think there's also a certain amount of irony in the fact that here I am giving a speech, a very uh, intellectual speech with a lot of quotes and a lot of um, language. It's very much um, left brain which is to say logical and argumentative and and linear. I don't think that um, the act of eating all by itself is necessarily a sensual experience for most people. I think sometimes it degrades to feeding. That the, the real culture of the table where you sit back and enjoy yourself and you interact with each other and you and you contribute something worthwhile to a conversation is not something a lot of us have a lot of experience with anymore because most of us are distracted with our own things or we take the food and sit down in front of the television and watch something else. We, we plug into something else rather than really invest in the experience, which is a sensual experience. So I'm, I'm not convinced that, that it's possible given our current set of uh, social arrangements to fully negate the effect. I agree with uh, your thesis that we live mostly within our own narrow and closed minds. But I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on your, your solution, which is to unify mind and body and while honoring the body. What type of lifestyle would that take, and how does it differ yeah. from, from ours now? It should be my lifestyle. Whenever somebody makes a criticism in print, in a book, in a magazine, or something, they're obligated to come forth with a solution to the problem that they that they identify. I heard this called the happy chapter. It's always the last chapter. Something uplifting. Something to do. Um, I think that the, the problem all by itself is difficult enough to recognize and to, to agree to that I haven't gone the next step to provide the solution to it. Did you get yourself out of it or are you in it up to Oh no, I'm very much a part of it. I'm, you know, I spend most of my days seated at, seated at my computer reading. I don't play a lot of video games, but I'm, I'm plugged in the way everybody else is but maybe not to the same degree because 
I definitely want to feel the sensations of my body. So I, I participate, for example, in sports, in endurance sports. And I'll turn everything off and I'll spend the time cooking and enjoying the meal with a bottle of wine and good conversation with everything else tuned out. And I, and I am a musician, so I, I play with other people where you share the musical idea. It's, it's out there somewhere. It's not in here, but it's out there in the space between. So um, in the previous speech I gave, I referred to Albert Borgman and his concept of the focal practice. And I basically listed his focal practices in this speech. And, and they're all ways of focusing the mind on something beyond the self, or within the self, or between selves, between other people. Again, part of a social con context. <coughs> I mean, if I if I mis misheard you, you can correct me. But I excuse me. I want to you know you to, uh, answer directly for me. The influence that society has on an individual and all the things that enticing him to fit in or her to fit in. How difficult is it for the individual not to be subject to these? Uh, the forces that brings them into the mass question. Yeah. Is it possible to stay out of it? No. I mentioned uh, the David Reisman book and the three orientations and how they are used to um, ensure conformity among people through shame and guilt and anxiety, right? So if you're in touch with people on almost any level, then you will be subject to those sorts of influences. No, I don't think you can escape them. Those people who do attempt to escape them, who become hermits in a shack somewhere writing their manifestos, or, or who are just simply communing with nature, are viewed by most people within popular culture or the dominant culture as being um, weirdos or wackos or, or crazy people because they're not participating in the world that we've all received. Is that, is that, is that a good or bad? Because I have an example in mind. The Amish people, the Amish people told the rest of us where to stick it. And they've been living like that for years here in the United States and various states around. To them and to me, they are human beings that are equal to other human beings. But they didn't fall for that us yet. Let me join you all so you can give me a nice name. I'm aware of the the Pennsylvania Dutch and the Amish and the Hutterites and other other really closely knit religious sects that have repudiated at one level or another uh, modern civilization and are, and are living according to their own rules within modern civilization. Uh, when I spoke about ego consciousness, however, that's something that we all have and it's a, it's a product of the Western mind that even those folks can't escape. If we really wanted to, to look at an at a entirely different way of being, one that we came from in antiquity before the formation of um, civilization, such as the artists who created the cave paintings felt, a certain participation in nature where everything around them was in alive and where everything was imbued with spirit. Uh, it was an animated world for them. Everything had animus. Everything had life, as opposed to the 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 dead world out there that we exploit and destroy. Um, that's barely even possible for us anymore. And there's only even a few indigenous cultures left on the planet who have not succumbed to the Western style of mind. Bob Charlie and then Bob. Oh, Bob, half these guys have repudiated modern civilization. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, <laughs> these clowns, <laughs> indigenous people. But seriously, 
Now you're saying it all in and now it's just in the social context. You can't get away from it. And you like this guy, Descartes, who did nothing but lock himself in a room. And then he came out and said, oh, now I have pure knowledge. He did not. He just came out an hour later. And I, in this social, then apparently if all knowledge is suspect in a social context, then all the, there's some guys that think theology is knowledge. Is that strictly and purely, there is no God, it's strictly social context? I kind of lost track of your question there, Chuck. Well, if all knowledge is tied to social context, <laughs> all of the experience religion, for social beings. Is there no objective religion? It's simply all tied to some sort of social context, and there is no God. You're asking me, is there real objectivity as distinct and separate from subjectivity? Yeah. Well, that's the... That's the basic mental framework that we've been working with for something like 6,000 years. But we didn't always think that way, and it's not always possible to think that way. And sometimes it's advantageous not to think that way. Especially when um, you're involved in something that requires union and fusion and, and uh, loss of self and disappearance of our normal categories. I think Bob is asking me to curate music for him or for us, and it's a it's a tall order, of course. I mean, it's a it's a question of taste, what you like and what you don't like. But I think it is also mediated by what you know about music and how you understand it. If you understand music primarily through the senses then something that's beautiful is beautiful to you and something that that works for your sensibilities works if um, on the other hand you're attending to other things like 50 cent who supplies a steady stream of misogyny and violence and imagery and and all kinds of nastiness if that's beautiful to you, then I then I think you've disconnected somewhere along the way. Or are, you, are you making a, are you saying that there's a, there's a judgment that can be made that, say, Mozart or Beethoven is superior to 50 Cent? Or any of these other guys? Well, I come from an art music background, so I, I tend to dismiss a lot of popular music at the same time that I do listen to it and I do enjoy it. But I don't think that it, it captures the, uh, the spirit of man in the same respect that most art music does, because most popular musicians, and I say most, but not all, uh, don't really approach it from the same perspective, especially in the modern day where pop music is approached from a commercial perspective. What can you put on the radio? What can you sell on iTunes? And, and what sort of notorious stage act can you put on that'll attract audiences to your, to your shows? Those aren't artistic statements to me. That's just, that's just making money. Um, Mozart and Beethoven's motivation, if I can peer into their minds and assume their motivations was probably more expressive of their age 
in a in a more wholesome context. Okay. Okay, so On that same note, so that uh, well, tell us your opinion of the Beatles. Oh, the whole year. I like the Beatles. They're they're time tested, unlike um, Lady Gaga. She too has been time tested, according to younger people. Her, her test has been about five years at most, whereas the Beatles have 40, 40 years or more of, of history behind them to confer some some value in their music. How about Britney Spears? Is a little bit longer. She's a pop tart. Share. Part of your speech, you were talking about Westernization. Uh, would things reverse if China became the new superpower? Would would that change things? In a parallel history, absolutely, it would change everything. Western Europe and the United States, coming out of Western Europe, has managed to dominate the globe. But we weren't always dominant for most of the. Um, history of the civilized world, China was dominant, but then they repudiated a lot of the things that took root in, in the Middle East and then Europe that enabled us to succeed. That's an argument that um, Jared Diamond makes in Guns, Germs, and Steel, what enables certain societies to succeed and what uh, causes others to fail. And Western Europe was the, uh, the happy benefactor of a whole or uh, not benefactor, but recipient of a, of a whole slew of things that enabled their success, whereas China had isolated itself. Right, so but if China becomes the oh, new superpower sorry. of the world, let's say in the next hundred years, would that... There's, there's the equivalent of the Greeks. China has pretty much adopted a Western um, style of capitalism, even within the... The, the basic communist government that they have set up. I don't think their mind fully matches the Western mind, but they're quickly getting there. So have they retained enough of their, their ancient mind from feudal China in order to turn back the clock and bring everybody in line with their thinking? I don't think so. I think the, the Pandora's box has already been opened and now it's all out there for us. Okay, Joe. Uh, yesterday was Beethoven's 281st birthday. Yeah. And his string quartets have a beauty that is almost incomprehensible until you compare it with Shostakovich, whose beauty is almost incomprehensible. And then you contrast that with um, uh, Mead Lux Lewis uh, beating out a fast tempo boogie, and Janis Joplin uh, singing Bobby McGee. Yeah, 50 cents. Solidarity. It's the same. It's the same thing. There's a beauty in each of them, and it transcends our physical being. Does it not? I don't want to discourage anyone from finding transcendent beauty in anything they find transcendent beauty in. So I, I can't I can't say, no, you shouldn't listen to that. That's bad for you. Uh, I don't always agree, and that's one of the interesting things about taste and culture is that you have your, your own. You subscribe to different ideals. I don't think they are the same thing, however. I don't think a boogie-woogie is the same thing as a Shostakovich team quartet. So, all right. Uh, Gene Mark. Uh, you, I think you mentioned the term, uh, I've heard that, but I don't understand it very well. Deep culture? That's Edward T. Hall's term. And um, as I said in the, in the speech, it's that, that different cultures have different metaphors and understandings of space, time, and relationships. I haven't read one of his books in quite a while, but I wanted to cite him because he gets at the idea that our metaphors define how we think. So the, I used time as the, as the principal example in my speech, and time is very different among cultures. I remember um, his contrasting the, the very regimented sort of keep your appointments down to the minute clock time that we enjoy 
in most of the United States as compared with the Latin world where they're very, well, you kind of do it when you do it and they break in the middle of the day for a siesta and everything is fluid and open to um, adjustment and nobody is running around harried trying to be places at certain times because it's just not part of their thinking. Thank you. Mm. All right, uh, Ed, I don't know if you have any comment can answer this, but India always seems to be a unique place, a place of rich wealth and extreme poverty, always peaceful, always philosophical, everybody yes. seems to get along. Do you have any comment on the way they might think that's different and experience? Can you address that? A friend of mine who has traveled in India uh, was telling me stories about it. I've never been there and I'm certainly not a student or a, a devotee of, of Indian culture. My impression is that it's an ancient culture and they have a kind of spirituality and that is part of their being that is kind of um, difficult for us to experience in the United States anymore because we've kind of turned our backs on a lot of that. It's, you know, spirituality on Sunday morning and on, on holidays like Christmas coming up. Um, but he said that one of the things that was especially characteristic of the Indians that he met, which were mostly working people, service people, bringing meals and cleaning rooms and whatnot, is that they couldn't multitask. They were linear thinkers, which is to say that things were done in a certain order and that you couldn't diverge from the sequence because they would lose their track and, and it, it was just not possible for them. So one person, he told an amazing story about how they were at a roadside cafe where they were getting what amounts to a smoothie, a fruit smoothie. So one person would order one, but the, the place where they prepared them wasn't on site, so he had to get on his bicycle and go and prepare it and bring it back. But there were three people who were ordering smoothies. Well, the Indian guy couldn't take three orders and come back with three drinks. He did one order, then the next order, and then the next order, because that's the way he thought. And so they were there at this roadside stand for an hour and a half, each of them waiting for their drinks, because it took about half an hour for each of them. That's just an anecdote. I don't know whether that actually answers your question, but it, it, it just demonstrates that they have a very different way of thinking than we do. Charles again. Yeah, I'm curious how Japan and culture is such a progressive civilization, so then what, somebody just decided, oh, we're not going to do this anymore? We're going to stagnate for a thousand years? Somebody just decided this? You can control culture? That's funny. Well, there are, there are certain turning points in history where one culture or another, or one, one political leader or another has refused to adopt something that was available to him because he thought that the costs would be greater than the the benefits. Um, the Japanese for a long or was it the Chinese for a long time refused to use guns. Where's the equivalent of the Greeks in the Asian culture? They look to China. Where? They look to ancient China. What? But like, look at the classic. Confucius. Nothing close. Was that question for me? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the equivalent of the Greeks and the Chinese culture? I would probably look to the, the Buddhist writers, like Lao Tse of the, the I Ching. The, they were mystics, and they, they had an understanding of Fortune the... Fortune telling? You can answer your own questions, Chuck. <laughs> Robert, are you asking a question or? Oh no, no. no. Okay. Let's go to rebuttals. All right. If we have run out of questions for the moment, uh, we can move on to our rebuttal period. Oh, yes. But uh, anyone questions? <laughs> what we will do. All right. All right.
go home and watch the same TV shows and talk about them at the water cooler the next day. Well, we all go now and we may watch some of the same TV shows, but there is such a wide diversity of them out there that, you know, you, you have a choice. And frankly, for me, I would much rather have a high-speed internet connection with complete access to video and all the wealth of information that is needed on a topic that I want to study. It's not all junk, Charlie. You just don't know where to look. <laughs> Pornography. Yeah, right. Pornography in the yellow pages. Well, well, Charlie, I'll tell you what. You've heard of a guy by the name of Gene Sharp? He wrote a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy. I learned all about him this week. And about the power of consent. You have to remember that one thing that marketers have found out, and all of us people who found out on this stuff, it takes our consent for these corporations to grow. It takes our consent to have these politicians in power. It takes our active consent and cooperation to patronize these businesses. And you have to remember, the consumer today has a lot more power than he did even 30 years ago. Because of the power of, let's say, the vote the almighty dollar provides, you can boycott a company, and you can go somewhere else where they may appreciate your business. And I can tell you from first-hand personal experience that the customer is dissatisfied with a company, and he's threatening to take it to the BBB, the Better Business Bureau, or he takes it to a higher level, uh, he's going to get listened to, and he's going to get taken care of, because a lot of companies do not want their reputations stained. And it is a lot harder today to maintain a stellar reputation than it is not to. And as far as we're concerned, you know, it's a lot easier to uncover scams than it was a few years ago. For me, the, what, what our speaker is saying is the demise of arts culture. I tend to disagree very, very fervently. Because for, I'll tell you one example is why. In order for somebody today to really succeed at a business or an endeavor, they necessarily have to be a little bit more artistic. Richard Florida, in a book called The Rise of the Creative Class, talks just about that. Thomas Friedman talks about putting that little extra special sauce of yourself into a product or service that you're delivering. Or, if you're a musician, putting that little bit of extra effort to be successful. And the thing is today it's so much easier to get noticed, to make a living at something that you really want to do. I myself find that it is so much, even just with my video alone, you know, I find they get backlog because I, don't have, I have so much to finish off. And other activities sometimes get in the way of my editing and putting stuff up online. But it's also a lot easier, even in the last two years, to put it up there than it was even five or ten years ago. Case in point, I was able to put up about 22 hours of video in less than 45 minutes to a YouTube account. And this also means that I should be able to get these college videos that I've been taking up and online fairly quickly. Which also means that my creative endeavors will probably be more acknowledged over time. And granted, it's been five years for me in the video industry practicing a little bit more, but I've gotten, I think, a modicum of some success at it. But that never would have been possible for me even 10 or 15 years ago without a twenty dollars to $40,000 investment in equipment and time. Or today, even if I am a good painter, you know, you can still digitize that stuff. You can do classes on your technique. And if you get a following, you will be able to express yourself even more. Today, we are much more diversified, maybe much more in groups of ivory towers. Maybe we do check our phones a little bit too often. And yes, there is a little something called distracted driving that I have a little problem with. Because when you need to be aware of anything in your body, you need to be more aware on the road 
because other clots aren't. But as far as the death of the sensorum, you know, I would much rather see it die a pleasant death because our lives are so much better and enriched because of technology today. Thank you. The speaker did a good job. He did his research, and it wouldn't take too much tweaking for him to go to Washington, D.C. and present that before a bunch of scholars. Uh, I have a uh, won't comment about it. In fact, I was worried that he would, one of them, you know, like mainstreamers that apologize for the system and so forth. He was nowhere close. Mm -hmm. He recognized that human beings can be conditioned mm -hmm. to follow that law of sheep. But to me, it's two things. Uh, Tim Bolger just said about success, fitting into society. I asked that question to the speaker. And, and to me, it's too tight. And I have to agree with Bolger to a certain degree. If you want to be recognized by multitude, if you want to be recognized by the guy in charge and get some crumbs from the loaf, then you do what he and they want you to do. But then you got other types of people that call themselves a human being, and they mean that literally. A human being is an individual, is not attached to anybody else. If you stuck your toe, I don't feel nothing. If I stuck mine, you don't feel nothing. You got a brain, I got a brain. I can do my thinking, you can do your thinking. Now, it depends on the price you want to pay. The individual, a lot of individuals do that throughout their lives. And although I'm a living uh, uh, witness, I'm not going to do what I don't want to do. And if you think, I'm going to put my nose up the ass, you can forget about it. <laughs> I can do my own thinking, because when you duck your toe, I don't feel shit. And if I fall down and break my leg, you don't feel shit. And you got an example of what most of us are familiar with. Take the gang, for instance. You say, well, why don't kids want the giants? And, oh, they want to fit in and blah, blah. And a lot of truth to that. They want to be recognized by somebody. They don't have enough self-confidence because they never give an opportunity. I was raised with the opportunity to respect themselves. George Washington had a good thing that they celebrate, not the guy that joined the game. So you ain't important to everybody else but you. Then you got the individual that uh, do his own thinking. And he knows the importance of his individuality. He knows the importance of being a human being. I don't understand how in the goddamn world that somebody going to place somebody else over them. Another goddamn human being over me? Fuck you. <laughs> we are human beings and we are individual human beings. And it always got people like that. You had a, I was a soldier. Guess what? That shit they was teaching me went through this head and outside the other. But guess what? I'm not retarded and I'm not a masochist. So I can do enough to get my out of a discharge. And that's what I got. I retired from an organization that it was us and them. Fuck us. It's me. I ain't got to fit in with you. I know what I have to do. And I know how to do it because I'm not part of the mess. Now, um, is that something unusual? No. It's no way it's unusual. Ever since the beginning of time, you had people that told the, the guy in charge to go fuck himself and told the masses you could go fuck yourself <laughs> and still be the human being that he respected. I'm an anarchist. Oh, you an anarchist, blah, 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 blah. Ask me what an anarchist is, and I will tell you what it is. Anarchist don't mean that I'm going to take a bottle of the cocktail, throw it in the, the coat house, and run over it. That's some shit you see in the movie. Mm -hmm. Anarchist is just what I will tell you is. I don't need nobody to tell me a goddamn thing. I don't need no rules and regulations. For me, I got the same 
uh, ability to know the difference between what's in my best interest and what's not in my best interest. And if you got people that don't like that, forget them. Normally, believe it or not, people respect your individuality. I'm telling you, people will respect your individuality. They'll get around and they'll stay distant from you and so forth and so on, but in the, found, in the end, kissing somebody's ass ain't going to make them your friend. Kissing somebody's ass will make you uh, uh, ass kisser of your enemy. <laughs> if you do what you're supposed to do, you feel good about what you do. If I was sweeping the goddamn floors, you could bet the corners would have dust in them. Why? Because I'm the goddamn motherfucker that's sweeping the floor. And I look over there and see some dirt that I don't left there. How do I feel? I don't feel too good. Now, am I the first person to feel ever since we had human beings, they thought just like I thought. Buddha was a prince. And Buddha said, fuck y'all. <laughs> I'm not living like that. And he went out in the woods somewhere. And you can go through the library and find books with a whole bunch of other people like that. And say, I'm not going to be part of this robotic mass. Because I don't need a master. Because a robot needs a master, and a master needs a robot. Okay. One can't exist without the other. Only three, in the, three out of the three people, you got three types. You got the robot, you got the creator of the robot. That, I call the master, and you got the individual. And that's the person that's saying, I'm not going to let y'all tell me what to do, how to be, and how to think. And you got a whole group of folks. I mentioned the aliens. You got people all over the world that are living completely different from how they live in New York, London, Sao Paulo, uh, Paulo Brazil, somewhere. Completely different. They living in the woods. They living in the jungle. Somebody gonna sit around and say, "Oh, they are they are freaks." Who care what you call me? I don't care what you call me as long as I'm in love with me. Uh, in response to Dr. Holland's uh, talk, I've got uh, three items, three different items, two personal and one, uh, I guess, intellectual, I guess. Uh, the idea of flow, uh, personally, the only time I feel flow now at my age is when I'm walking. I do a lot of walking. Anything else I either, I used to do, I either it can't do it or I fall asleep during it. <laughs> no. Flow for me is kind of walking. Uh, meals, uh, another example of what uh, I think Dr. Holland is talking about. I, you know, I'm single, I eat most of my meals alone, not all of them, but most of them. And I eat, often eat breakfast, eat standing up. I put this stuff together uh, in a shaker with water and dry powder and supplements. It takes me about four minutes to five minutes to get it together and a minute to shake it. It takes me maybe two or three minutes to drink it, and that's my whole meal. All standing up, walking out, listening to the radio. Uh, the third point is, uh, before Dr. Holland mentioned uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, it brought that idea to mind. He has a chapter called kleptocracy. I think that's the only, I've heard that word before, but it's not in the dictionary. It's a pretty new, new word. He, he has the idea that there are four levels of governments, bands, tribes, chiefdoms which no longer exist, and states. And he talks about how our society has changed as we've gone through these uh, different states, implying that bands and uh, tribes were, I guess, more uh, personal and more maybe humane uh, than the uh, chiefdoms or the uh, state. Um, and he says there are only uh, these more primitive types left in parts of uh, New Guinea and South America. And he, he feels they're kind of superior. But uh, on the other hand, 
he lives in L.A. And uh, I don't know if I trust anybody a lot who lives in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how much time do we have, friends? Six minutes. Okay. Um, oh, gosh, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about. I don't know if I can squeeze it all in in six minutes. But, uh, the first thing i got to mention is the passing of Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, too bad. He was a huge uh, Christopher Hitchens fan. Um, I have to credit Christopher Hitchens with probably giving me the catalyst for uh, investigating uh, in great detail the war in Iraq and changing my opinion on it uh, more in line with uh, Mr. Hitchens' opinion after the things I uh, read, which led me to read other things. Uh, and of course he got a lot of, uh, still is getting a lot of criticism for for his position on uh, you know, favoring the war in Iraq. But uh, he was over there for a while, though, and saw, uh, you know, what the probably 25 different minorities were living under, and uh, if you were a, an atheist, you know, what kind of, what you could expect. So, uh, anyway, uh, I met Christopher Hitchens uh, here at Left Bank Books in 2004. He was on his book tour for uh, uh, Love, Poverty, and War. Or War, Poverty, and Love, I forgot the exact title. It's a collection of essays over the years from his uh, writings in The Nation and Vanity Fair. Uh, the place was absolutely packed. They made a uh, special exception. He was allowed to smoke, but nobody else was. And so they had to get a little, gave him a little ashtray. So he, was, he gave his lecture and smoked and drank a Manhattan while he was, while he was talking. And the place was just packed, and I mean like people were like pressed up against the glass inside, you know, like, like sardines. It was just total wall to wall, floor to ceiling pack of people. And uh, at, at the end of the uh, lecture, you know, uh, after people got done buying their signed copies, I did buy a signed copy. And no, it's not for sale. Uh, after everybody left, me and a few other hangers on were you know, stood around and talked to him for quite a while until the until left bank books closed. <laughs> you know, shoe was out of there, and then I of course went on back to the train. I had to get back to uh, back to, back home in Indiana. But uh, Hitch uh, Hitchens uh, invited the people who were left to go across the street with him and continue drinking and talking over there, which which they did. He, he was a hard hard drinking uh, hard drinking hard smoking guy. But boy, uh, very so intelligent and and uh, just. Brilliant writer and a great command. He has a great command of vocabulary. So I really enjoy his stuff. I hope you read some stuff by Hitchens. Yeah, please do. Uh, great place to start. Uh, God is not great. Fantastic book. Uh, he's considered one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the new atheists: uh, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett. Those are the four guys. Uh, every atheist should should read. Anyway, uh, now to Dr. Holland's speech today. Um, first of all, this uh, this constant attack on capitalism. You know, I don't know what it is, why liberals cannot stand other people have freedom, but the three the three things you, you know, the, the, well, you know, the invisible hand. You know, Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, and, and actually in Book Three of the Wealth of Nations, and. What, you, what that really means is that, you know, when you're acting in your own self-interest, for you, then typically things are going to be better for everybody else as a result of that. When you're working hard at your business, let's say you're a baker or something, and you're getting there bright and early in the morning and baking your bread, fresh ingredients, and, you know, a, a good-sized loaf, you know, proper weight, you know, good price, delivered, you know, hot and fresh, early in the morning, I mean, that that's going to make you successful, and it's a, a benefit to the customers. I mean, you know, by you, if, you were, if you're the type of guy that's going to come in late or make crappy bread or not use fresh ingredients, or cheap customers on the weight, you know, you're selling something as a one-pound loaf and there's only 
14 ounces in there or whatever, what's, what's going to happen? You know, those customers are going to vote with their dollars somewhere else. That freedom of choice. Yes. That's right, freedom of choice. And this is why this is the evil of socialism. When, when you have the government, this is something Adam Smith was critical of, is, you know, it's better to have the invisible hand of the free market at work, people operating in their own self-interest, than it is to have the government or somebody else saying, well, there should be, you should be making this free bread because it's good for the community. Therefore, you know, we're going to have, you know, we're going to allocate so much resources to making bread because it's a good thing. Well, see, the government doesn't need to do that or have to do that. But, you know, the free market is the best arbiter of that. And then people acting in their own self-interest uh, will ensure that there's going to be uh, adequate supply. And, of course, here's the thing. Uh, when you have, uh, you know, free market at work, nobody knows better what decisions to make regarding what the product mix, you know, the size, the colors, the flavors, yeah. you know, the choices, the artists, whatever. Nobody knows better than that guy, you know, making it and selling it. You know, the individuals right there at the, mm -hmm. right there on the front lines. Not some bureaucrat in Washington deciding what is, is best for us or whatever. Uh, and, you know, again, this, and this is why socialism always leads to totalitarianism. Wherever you go, because whenever you have some guy or, or government in a distant place deciding what resources are going to be allocated to make what things, that you're taking away decisions that should have been left in the marketplace. You're stripping us of a freedom yeah, to make a decision. Mine, a mountain, uh, and by the way, just to let you know, the sensorium is not dead. The the uh, political economy book club still meets face to face at the Henry George <laughs> School about every other about every other month. Our next meeting will be February 22nd, and we'll be discussing the second half of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. Thank you. <laughs> hey, the invisible hand. Yeah, Charlie. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. Uh, this is my first time here. I'm going to be talking about the Wealth of Nations. Um, I'm and it's nice to have uh, to know to this community exists in Chicago because I was like widely searching for it. Um, I, I, this is my third year here in America, um, so part of me of my language is uh, a bit insufficient or not uh, incorrect in a, some sort of way. But, um, and with, with I think I, I totally agree with your thesis, a hundred percent. But um, I, I feel I feel like instead of working, sort of not against, but sort of in a way of re refusing, in a way of technology. I may be wrong, but that's why I got um, with technology or all that sort of. Um, materialism or, or just uh, things in general and how society trends is going on is is contradicting in a way and I think that contradicting energy is what kind of I think that is unhealthy in a way because this is how our mass is going and and you're totally right about how you know everything is because we are conformed in a way in a society from the moment that we are born, basically, because we are learned or taught how to, you know, how to switch off lights, how to turn off the uh, TV remote, um, or just basically, you know, potty training, just everything. Um, we're taught from the minute we're born, and sometimes that can be um, frustrating in a way because, I mean, for me, I, I didn't choose to. to, to be physically in a way I think my parents do, you know. But that is, but there is some sense of. Do you want me to? No, it's a little closer. Okay. There's some sense of. Um, I'm here, so where do I go from here? That's relating to with you how. You're here in this trend, in this generation. What do you go from there? 
I mean, I see myself, maybe like when I look around today, I may be the youngest one or a bit different from people here. Um, and with my generation, I, I definitely am, am bombarded with uh, media in general. I'm constantly in science and like uh, brands of clothing or internet access. So in my generation, which is, I think, sort of different from yours, that the information I'm receiving is, is totally different. It's totally, in a way, I am more um, used to the, the utility of how tools can be, how, how, uh, you know, how Photoshop works, or how YouTube works, or how internet works in general. But when I, when I was thinking about this, when I put myself in, in, in or your generation kind of shoes, I, I kind of, I kind of think, you know, why, why would, why would somebody feel that way, or somebody who would feel like shorts, or think that, you know, censor in a way is, is, uh, is limited, and, you know, I think it is, just taken back from, like, you know, the Plato, how Plato thinks that, you know, everything, you know, um, they think that poets or, um, Poems in general, epic poems. Um, that at the end of his writing, he said that he sh they should uh, ban epic poems in general because it's giving so much sensation to the people. But when we look at epic poems today, we don't feel the same thing because we are so much like sensory exposed to so many things because of technology, for instance. And obviously. The trend is limiting us from feeling this. I do agree, but with that as a given, where do you go from here? And I feel like, is it because that maybe your children or maybe your, your grandchildren are less interactive with how information are receiving or how, how we, information is given through generations before? Because Right now, I don't, I don't actually go to my parents anymore for, for any information really for what I'm receiving because, you know, except from wisdoms or experiences, I can just get that in the internet, to be honest, you know? <laughs> but that's just me. I don't know. And that is kind of interesting and to see how, how you know, people from different generations can feel about that information availability of the information that is accessible, I guess. Um, but I feel, I mean, I, I think I want to end this pretty soon, but um, I feel it's definitely a benefit. And where do you go from there? Um, I mean, without without the internet today, I wouldn't be here because I, I searched this up, you know? I searched, I typed in, uh, lectures in Chicago area, things like that. If I wasn't given the information on the internet, I wouldn't be receiving this kind of sensory emotions that I'm getting it right now. So I feel that that availability is definitely important. Thank you. institution is definitely a gem in the city and I'm so so happy that I found it. Um, thank you so much, seriously. And thank you Dr. Hong for your uh, great piece. It was very very insightful. But um, the way how I feel about it is I feel like I know brief, you briefly mentioned that you were a pessimist. I don't know if you were you know, joking or not. But I got a lot of optimistic connotations, like positive connotations from this lecture because for me it, it affected me as an I feel like our society as, as a whole, if we were to generalize, we're on this train, uh, we're on this train of consumerism, um, corporatism, um, bullshit politics, and a lot of people, like a lot of our citizens, we refuse to question the, um, the authority. We're, we just accept what's, we accept the, the, the nurture in the situation that we're, we're given, and we just become these uh, masses of vegetables. I feel like, and I feel like more people need to give a shit, more people need to give a damn, more people need to ask questions, 
and more people need to live a more passionate life. And I think the, that's the reason why. I mean, there's always like the postmodernism in me, like the nihilist in me that says, what's the point of life? There is no interest in intrinsic value in anything. And that there's always that subjective take on life where your life and all these great ideas, they wouldn't even really matter if you were dead, you know? So why not during in that short period of time you live in, you, you study what you're passionate about and you talk to people and you are constantly learning. Um, so there's definitely, um, very, very contradicting ideas. And I think when you live your life, you're you're constantly faced with contradicting ideas uh, and hypocrisy. And you're always in a fine line of what should I do and how should I do it. But that's why, again, life is such a subjective experience. And I think um, Dr. Hollins and what he's, um, I, think, I think personally from, a, a, I haven't met you very briefly and I couldn't even speak to the whole show. But I feel like a lot of people in this in this room, they're very passionate people. and. Um, I think that's why ideas are clashing, but I'd rather have them clash rather than um, us moving in a parallel line. Yeah. So thanks so much again. And I can't It's the antenna connection in the back. Oh, it's not you. Talk down to it. <laughs> it's not you at all. It's not you at all. It's the antenna connection in the back. Okay. Yeah, I'm right. holding it. So, so um, when we talk about the sensorium, Dr. Holland mostly mentioned, you know, uh, physical sensations like when we eat, um, like when we interact with each other in a physical way, like we're doing right now, because we're all physical here, and. Um, thinking of the sensations that we feel uh, in our bodies because of um, what we eat or our, um, um, what we review. I, I can't remember all of them. But I think that uh, the sensorium also um, involves our emotions and um, that is part of the sensations that we feel our emotions as well as just physical sensations. And I don't think too much has been talked about that. And I want to say that I think, um, I'm gonna, and I'm going to combine these two in a minute, um, for causes that I'm not going to go into or discuss, uh, we have increased in our number of people in the world, and we've increased in the distance uh, that we travel all the time. Um, um, people have moved away from the nuclear family for whatever reasons, economic reasons. I Like I said, I'm not going to go into the causes of them. Uh, but the people that we know are often far away from us, and they're not just inside our homes or down the street. And so I think technology has given us a way to continue to communicate with these people uh, in a way that we would not be able to if we didn't have uh, the technology. We could send them a letter and that maybe they would get it in a few days and maybe we would hear back from them in a week. And we wouldn't be as much in touch with them. If we are on email or Facebook or Twitter, 
and not on the TV watching Jerry Seinfeld talk about nothing, uh, we can communicate with these people and we can have, I think, meaningful interactions with them that are not just virtual, uh, dead interactions and that uh, cause us to have sensations such as emotions that we would have here in this group talking. Uh, if we were all online in a chat room, we might still experience some kinds of sensorium because we would be having an active discussion even though we weren't physically in the same room. And I, I disagree with him that the virtual reality of those things is, is, is not uh, part of the sensorium and has no effect on us whatsoever. So I think, and another thing that I think has happened is a lot of people have gone into a cocoon because of either the real or perceived uh, notion that there's more crime out there, there's more things that are dangerous to us. And so for that uh, reason, a lot of things can come to us uh, inside and we're not just isolated and trapped in those things. And uh, one example I wanted to give of, um, of uh, how I think uh, technology uh, is similar to the real thing uh, is, for example, if I want to go to a, a concert of uh, uh, Beethoven or uh, Mozart or uh, Janis Joplin or 50 Cent and I, and I don't have the, the funds or maybe the concert is sold out, if I can watch this on television or if I can listen to it uh, on a recording, then it's still going to give me maybe not the same bodily sensations because I'm not going to be sitting in the front row uh, where I'm hearing the drums or I'm hearing the speakers and it's making my body vibrate, but I'm going to be getting the emotional sensations that I would get if I were actually virtual or if I were actually physically there. So I want to say that um, uh, while I agree with uh, Almost everything that he said, I disagree, or, or my re, uh, comment and, and additional, my rebuttal is I don't think the sensorium has flown away. I think that it has just changed uh, how it is. It's just changed its nature, and that we still have the ability to do the physical, and then in addition to that, we also have the ability to do this in a virtual way, which actually adds to uh, what we were able to experience. You guys have gone into a cocoon. <laughs> <laughs> you never left yours. <laughs> 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 for, 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 for Bob Holland's uh, talk, uh, by virtue of his superior wisdom and learning, which I will concede, I rather have came up here to rebut some other comments that were made about socialism always leading to a totalitarian country. Well, it's true. Um, no, it's not always true, and I'm hardly a defender of the socialist system. I can best be described as a John F. Kennedy, New Frontier-style Democrat. But having said that... And he cut taxes. But having said that, nevertheless, the idea that socialism always leads to a totalitarian <coughs> country is bullshit, plain and simple. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The New Deal was accused of being socialist, the, the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the creation of all the various New Deal programs that put people back to work and gave them life and hope. Was that uh, totalitarianism? Well, and the wealthy people who had been running the country prior to the time Franklin Roosevelt took over, yeah, they thought so, and they were wrong. And same with the people who criticized John Kennedy and the New Frontier. I don't buy that argument. Instead, I would remind my friend that President Harry Truman, and who, who, by the way, gave us his fair deal, the president said, and I quote, no matter, you, no matter what you do in this world, there's always some dumb son of a bitch who won't like it. It's the antenna connection, it's not the microphone. We'll have it fixed soon. Good old American science and surplus. I wonder if it's technology. Yes. Well, it's better to have them, but they cause tremendous stress. Um, still well, maybe while you're still working on it, you engage in a shameless self-promotion.
motion. Then speak uh, up. The next meeting of the speakers, which I got here at the last minute, will be December 30th at La Puerta Restaurant, 2658 North Milwaukee, Taqueria, neighborhood Taqueria. And the topic will be <clears throat> the authentic life, so you all need to go and stop being ponies. You know, just kidding. Just kidding. But, uh, all right, I'll start anyway. I'm going to wait for technology. Quite, um, right. right. uh, I didn't, uh, oh, we had left the sensorium totally. Uh, but, um, so where do we start here? It's not the traditional uh, mind-body problem of philosophy, um, which no one has yet solved anyway. Um, that tries to explain consciousness and its relation to the body, and nobody can figure it out yet. Uh, the scientists have tried for decades recently, and they, <clears throat> they made a little progress, but they really haven't solved the problem whatsoever, neuroscientists. But uh, <clears throat> let's start on the social level, on the social level. I sure would hate them there, though. Uh, not this society, not many societies. They're sort of in our image now, and that's awful. But, uh, okay, let's start socially, in the social context. Yeah, right. Most people do um, live in uh, their own minds, in their closed minds. They don't let many new ideas in if they conflict with old ones. And uh, it's sad, but uh, our minds are pretty narrow, too. If I could just go by my students as examples, I mean, they just can't really, they can't really comprehend an abstract idea. 90% of the typical students, better students. Yeah, we'll have a much better ratio. But the typical student, 90% don't get the abstract ideas. 90%. I mean, such so basic ideas like the God question. Most of them can't raise it. Does God exist or not? Well, my parents brought me to church, so, you know, the Bible says Jesus died for everybody. Um, yeah, what about these two things here? He didn't have a clue about that himself, but uh, anyway, uh, and things like um, resolving the problem of evil, no clue, they don't have any clue, and I don't think this has been much different. I might forget the old person recently, but uh, it's been their way for a long time. Um, so we have the total relativism of society today noted by our speaker, and that's utterly deplorable yesterday. Uh, and anything to know. Pretty much. Um, now, um, what about uh, the senses and the mind and relating them in a social context? Do we need to focus on one experience? No, no, no I don't think so. That would totally separate mind from mind. That's not good. Um, and so the last thing you want to do, I mean, that's what many people have done, of course, living in their own minds, <clears throat> their own worlds. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I know Albert Bergman personally, and when I knew him, he was a total bore. You know? <clears throat> uh, but anyway, um, for me, I, I, I find this problem of mind and body solved by multitasking, because when you multitask, uh, you uh, get more meaning. You know, more meaning, you get twice as much meaning that way. It probably doesn't do as well on either one, but it's still like 150% on both, out of 200, you know, so it's better than 100 on one. Uh, so that's what I do all the time, and I enjoy it fully, and I get double meanings that way, <clears throat> you know, from like preparing class lectures and watching television at the same time, no problem. You know, I might miss a little on both. Uh, I'd say it's more than 75%, I get more than 75% from both. So, um, I would just say t um, to um, act free from the sensorium, all you need to do is just engage the world and people as, as fully as you can, uh, <clears throat> as richly as you can, uh, on emphasize the arts, as the best dancers and the best experiences, the best feelings, the best ideas. <clears throat> uh, and also I'd emphasize time as being precious and very limited. <clears throat> I would totally, uh, not totally, but I would much avoid computers, uh, leading just yes, to a idiotic virtual world where people become totally lost there. Um, <clears throat> they never come back, it seems to me. 
and it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, <clears throat> although email is better than nothing. You know, before email, I have no contact with others. Uh, <clears throat> now I've got half-assed contact. You know. They don't read my emails. They don't reply to mine. You know. I waste my time sending them out. <laughs> A lot of time, but it's better than nothing, you know, which is what I had before. <clears throat> as far as human contact, you know, <laughs> well, enough of that. Um, the, uh, yeah, have autonomy, have your own damn beliefs, you know, for your own reasons, and um, have a respectable individuality. You have to respect yourself above all. Okay, um, hope to see you the cemetery. I've got a lot of fun, a lot more. All right. I think we're all right. No, you're not. No, I'm not. Don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. Um, just be eclectic. Yeah. Charlie. Just be eclectic, Always. Charlie. All right. Let's see. First of all, let's thank Dr. Allen again. Um, the flight from the sensorium. I'm not certain what that is. Is it a flight from materialism? Um, is it? An escape from rationalism into the aesthetic, uh, or is it coming to the college complexes every week <laughs> at eight o'clock on Saturday? That's how I escape my sense. Uh, I'll take C in that case. Um, has has there been evidence of this in the Western intellectual tradition? Uh, yes, there has. There has been a very a flight from the sensorium. For about a thousand years, it was called the Dark Ages, in which rational thought was abandoned for theology uh, and religion. Uh, then, fortunately, we had a period called the Enlightenment, and we got back on track. I, uh, you know, the, we came up with some of these things, a little discussion here on multiculturalism, and I've looked at other cultures, and some of the others, and I don't think the Western, I don't know, it's certain about a flight from the sensorium, the Western culture uh, is unmatched, and regardless of things, the books of gun germs and steels and things like this, I don't think that's a fully explanation of what's been going on in our intellectual tradition. Um, and I don't think other cultures even come close, I'm sorry, India and China. I was studying them a good bit, but I've yet to see anything that matches the discoveries and the advances in philosophy, chemistry, medicine, uh, physics. Is there, in these other cultures, is there a Darwin? Is there an Einstein? Uh, look at all the discoveries. The other day, informally, I was looking at the the periodic chart of elements. How many elements were discovered in another culture outside of the West? I don't think any uh, possible primitive things, but um, there's something about the intellectual tradition here, and it, it seems to have a utilitarian function that works. Um, you bounce around a little bit here, you're talking about time. I don't know in the West, They've always, I gave a lecture here on the calendar, Bob, and they've always had a pretty good idea of what constitutes time. Uh, the only time, again, the only time, the time that in the West it caused a problem here was again in the Middle Ages when religion said the only thing you have to worry about, the world was constant in, in the Christianity. And the only thing that was going to change was the end, this coming, the end times. And the world was fixed and finished. And there was this, this stifling of thought for about a thousand years. And that's the only time that I think the concept of time um, was altered. Uh, embracing these rationalists? Uh, no, there's... There, and Bob hit on it, there's been the debate going on, but I, I don't know what's achieved by this uh, rationalism or what, what you, you can get some fairly bizarre results 
when you just think your way towards truth, you can end up in some really bizarre fashions. And if anything, it's it, that's if that's what the flight from the sensorum results. Uh, try to rigidly stay in empirical, empirical based truth, if anything. Uh, doesn't mean we cannot be embraced humanism, uh, certainly. It doesn't mean we have to be robotic in our attitudes and, and, and dealings with each other. But I'm not going to go off into some rationalist kind of bizarre, strange, untestable, in which there's no yardstick type of truth. Uh, some talk here about identity. Uh, I don't know. You define yourself in a society. Or it's, it ain't that hard. <laughs> I mean, it, it's there's some complaints now that our options are limited, perhaps, uh, which is certainly a valid complaint. However, we can define ourselves pretty much. I don't know. It's not a really difficult thing to do. Now, if the flight of the sensorium is defined as modern art, then you're entirely right on target. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to understand the whole subject of art entirely on my own. And let me tell you, these modern artists are really Talk about a flight. These guys are totally nuts. <laughs> this is strange looking stuff. <laughs> Some of these artists. These are sick people. <laughs> I mean, there's one feature of modern art that I attracts me and that it makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. There's this bizarre stuff out there. If anything, a flight from the sensorium, that's evidence of it. If you want to go up in some strange world that they reside in, you know, be my guest. You know, I, I, I mean, these Dadaists and all these guys, you know, they're pretty cool, though. But anyhow, you've given us some things to talk about here. Uh, you know, regarding the cultures, I, I, I appreciate all the other cultures, and I, I think the marvelous aspects of it, I, I truly enjoy learning about them, embracing them, but I still don't understand fully, completely what there was in the Western world that put us on track to read the rest of the world. I'm sorry, it's just sort of kind of trailing a bit behind and I don't think they're ever going to catch up to us. Anyhow, thank you very much.
look at all this stuff. I, I tell you, I, a good deal of my life has been, uh, I'm thinking, has been concerned with socialism. And socialism, despite what Bob says, is not whether it was Marxist socialism or anybody else's socialism, not necessarily government operation, particularly when it's a bourgeois government. Uh, uh, but then, what is socialism? Yeah, what is this thing? Yeah. Uh, there are there are umpteen different socialisms. You have to make your own socialism. I'm sorry. It's a way of living together. Yeah, and and if you want a good society, you're dreaming of socialism, uh, whether it's a Platonic socialism or a Bumerian socialism or a uh, yeah, it's an alternative to what we know. And Karl Marx was the genius who, do, who analyzed what we do know of society and how it works, and uh, proposed that we find better ways. And he pointed in the direction of where people were working to uh, make a more free society, where people would be more free. You don't, you know, what I think of you know, turning things over to the bourgeois government, you know, that can, the best government money can buy, uh, I, I shudder. I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's it's not any better than anything uh, that uh, well it's not it's, it's it's the kind of economy we've got and that economy has a few faults like a whole lot of people and uh, industries not working, and a whole lot of people thrown out of their homes, and a whole lot of people uh, looking for some way of sustenance, and people hating each other or fearing each other. You know, we we can do better, and. Uh, there are ways, and uh, people have found them, and uh, I, I hope that we can learn from uh, socialists and others, both in, in the United States and elsewhere. And yes, I, I, certainly Marx did not call capitalism uh, the, the uh, the, the real foe, what the real foe is, is our giving up on making our life together unlivable, or unhuman. Okay? That was awesome. Okay. Relax. <laughs> Authenticity. Well, thank you for hanging in there with me. I guess I'll be one of the few speakers to get us out early. <laughs> um, I set myself up for failure, I think, when, in the last few speeches that I've given, because I bite off more than I can chew. I adopt a, a thesis that is fairly arch and very difficult to demonstrate to people who aren't already inside my mind. And in fact, uh, like with the last one, the liberal democratic impulse, I pointed to a full-length book treatment of the same thesis by Morris Berman, who had 
that appeared a year after me, and so, you know, maybe he'll write a book on the flight from the sensorium soon. <laughs> uh, my ideas, I think, benefit for, from, or would benefit from a, a full-length treatment in a, in a book, and they're difficult to demonstrate in a speech even the sort of expanded format that we have here with the question answers and the rebuttals. But nonetheless, I think some of you have heard a completely different speech tonight from what the, I gave. Quite so, sir. Quite so. Sort of cherry picking and, and admitted that I'm just as prone to confirmation bias as anyone else, which means that I can go and seek out the information I need to try and demonstrate my point, and, and everybody does that to a certain degree, rather than a completely wide open, well, let's run the experiment and see what happens approach. I don't think any of us have that, especially when the nature of the topic is more argument than it is, or, or discussion than it is a scientific uh, setup. So, uh, somebody accused me of attacking capitalism. Somebody accused me or, or said that I had said something about relativism. Now, I might have said something along those lines in the question and answer, but that was not part of the speech that I gave. If I wanted to attack capitalism beyond the comment that I made that it's been shown to be utterly corrupt, then I would say it's a complete disaster because in order to live the way we live, we're destroying everything. But that's a different speech. That's about environmentalism and ecology and, and uh, a way of life that is unsustainable. Uh, the reports have come out repeatedly that the rest of the planet lived like Americans do with all of the wonderful quality goods and services and uh, information available to us that it would take five Earths to support it. But we don't even have one Earth to support us because we're tallying deficits, ecological deficits that are going to come back and destroy us along with the ecosphere. But that's a different speech and that's not the one I'm giving today. The one I'm giving is about spirituality and what goes on in the mind. It has less to do with our material well-being and it has more to do with how we relate to each other as social beings and how those relations are mediated by ideas and social constructs and social context and hypotheses and yes even the objects of our creation, our technology and our institutions. That was the content of my speech, and I don't know that any of you, frankly, gave a rebuttal that was about that stuff. That's what I was all about. So if you cherry-picked something out of my speech to say, well, I agree with that, but I disagree with that, you're not disproving anything, you're just expressing yourself. And I appreciate that, and we're all here to do that, but you're not engaging my topic. The idea of individualism, the sort of radical individualism, individualism that we practice as Americans, in my view, is intellectually bankrupt for a variety of reasons. <laughs> the first thing is, is that about 20 years ago, they discovered mirror neurons in the human brain. Those neurons fire when we observe someone else feeling an emotion or doing something, which means that the idea of separateness is simply not true. We participate in an action that we observe. So the most obvious example of feeling someone else's pain which our gentleman here said he, he doesn't, is when a child falls down and, and starts crying, what do we do? We empathize. We are feeling their pain. It may not be the same jabbing, stabbing pain from when they hit their elbow on the floor, but we still feel their experience because we observe something and we participate in their experience. That's what mirror neurons do to us. They're commonplace in... Um, 
apes and, and man. They first discovered them in apes, and then they discovered them in men. So I, I, that's just an example, but I think uh, it goes all the way through our biology, that we are not separate beings, that we are not, uh, we may be physically distinct, but even our physical distinctions are kind of fluid when you consider how much skin we shed and all the hair that comes off of our bodies and the food that goes in and comes out the other end, the air that goes in and then comes out the other end, the separability of, of so many of our physical attributes, and then down to the subatomic level, the fact that the whole mass of us, what holds it together, if you look at it from an from a atomic level? We don't really know. It's all part of a larger environmental context. Someone said, chiefdoms don't exist any longer in the modern world, and I think that's just flatly untrue. There's a few of them now, but they still exist. One of the important um, voices in the United States that we rarely ever attend to are the councils of chieftains of the American Indians, or Native Americans if I adopt the PC term. Those folks have a completely different style of mind, and it hasn't been fully corrupted and incorporated into the American uh, Western European style of mind that is, that is um, taking over the world. So those folks are pointing to the environment that they were more in tune with, that they affected with, that they were participated in, and saying, what are you doing? You're destroying everything. You're destroying everything. The tar sand landscape up in Alberta is like a moonscape that's so badly disturbed. I also heard something kind of interesting that we built something like, or we've already abandoned 14,000 windmills that we bought for sustainable energy because the mechanics of it don't support economically the the good neighbor idea that we actually maintain something that we build. It's like cheap electronics, cheaper to abandon it and build a new one. To me, that's a, that's a travesty. There's a, there's a physical reality to, to those things that it's hard to deny. They, they litter the landscape and they, they provide one thing, but they take away another thing, which is the trade-off that all technology has. One of the books I was reading in preparation for the speech, Coming to Our Senses by Morris Berman, written back in 1989, discusses, among other things, the fact that we used to live among animals. I didn't put it in the speech because I didn't think I had time. Obviously, I have a little bit of time to bring it up now. Um, the idea of the zoo or the menagerie as a collection of animals for us to go and observe is a relatively recent invention. It's only about 250 years old. And of course, by caging animals for our enjoyment, which is a, an animal presence among us that we don't otherwise have, of course we destroy the animals. Not physically, but we destroy their animal nests because they sit around and they don't behave like animals anymore. They behave like caged animals. They go mad, frankly. So it's not a tiger or a lion or a bear that you're observing in there, a polar bear or, or anything else. You're observing some strange facsimile of it because it's not really the same thing as the, the animal that exists out in nature. Don't go in a lion's cage. Similarly, the idea of experiencing something through media is another facsimile experience. And it is, to me, flight from the sensorium because we don't even recognize how much is lost in that experience by not being present in the room. So the symphony orchestra is most familiar to me of, the, of many of the art forms that I consume. And I have a very nice stereo system and I can turn it up as loud as I want and I can hear as much sound to me as possible, but there is nothing, there is no stereo system in the world that can replicate the sound of that 
orchestra in the room because they have not yet figured out a way, nor will they ever, how to replicate the sound of the double bass. How to, to, to reach the, the dynamic highs and dynamic lows. How to add the visual part of it. How to add the, the audience participation part of it. You cannot participate in an experience sitting alone on your couch with other audience members because they're not there. That's why they add laugh tracks to uh, sitcoms so that you can feel other people laughing and laugh with them. It encourages you. That's the mirror neurons working. You join other people's behaviors, whether it's laughing or crying or pain or emotion or anything else, because we're wired to do it. That's part of our biology. So anybody who's been to the theater versus sitting at home watching the DVD knows it's a superior experience. Anybody who sees something occur in live action, like a, a theater, <coughs> knows that that's superior yet to something displayed on the screen with all of its flatness, despite the, the current preoccupation with 3D imagery. <laughs> Multitasking is not adding to the quality of experience. It is subtracting from it because brain studies have shown that we skim along the surface when we multitask. We can't settle into whatever the experience is. We can lie to ourselves that we're getting more, but in fact we're getting less. And there's science to show it. I brought up in the past the book, uh, The Shallows, by Nicholas Carr, and he unpacks this in, in great detail with much scientific support. So I'll simply point you to The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, and you can, you can read about it yourself. You don't have to take my book. There's another book, or not really so much a book, it's an article that I recall called People of the Screen, and it's by... by Christine Rosen, and I've made comparison in the past, not tonight, about the image on Wall E, the Pixar movie, where all the people are floating around in the, the little carts, they've become bloated and unable to support their own body weight, and they're walled in by screens. They can't think to look elsewhere, because their whole reality is governed by what's right in front of their faces. And so there's a scene in the movie where the woman steps out of her seat, goes to the side of the spaceship that's orbiting somewhere out past Jupiter, because the, the planet Earth has been so wrecked by technology and capitalism and uh, population overshoot. And she steps out and looks out and sees the stars for the first time in her life through a window, the window of the spaceship. Now, it was a gag in the movie, but there's something really true about that. She was separated from the sensorium. She had instead the facsimile in front of her, and it simply would not work the same way for her. She was divorced from reality. I've referred again and again, and I started with the quote, this, the four stanzas from The Ecstasy by John Donne. It was an introduction, it was a teaser, and it's a very beautiful use of language to indicate and demonstrate that the body itself is the ground of experience. There is no other way for us to experience reality other than through the body. That's what it means to be embodied. There is no such thing as objective reality. There is no such thing as experience that is not shot through with emotional baggage because that's how we process it. We process it through the body, through the senses, through the mind, but it is all these things combined together and they're not separable. We cannot adopt the pose of objectivity and expect that we're actually seeing truth because that's not how we function. It seriously isn't. But most people are so unaware of that because they have this perspective from behind the eyes looking out into the world that what you see is truth and what you experience is truth. That's a fiction. What we experience is much more than all that and sometimes less. With respect to what we consume, what we allow ourselves to be exposed to, what we will uh, refuse 
to allow into our consciousness. I practice a, a kind of media ecology. I try to choose wisely because I recognize some things are good, some things are bad, some things are uh, really bad. This is the idea of uh, how we process information, right? Some ideas are bad, and once they take hold, it's impossible to dislodge them because they become reinforced, if nothing else, through sheer repetition. One of those ideas is, let the free market operate. Just let it go. It'll take care of itself. That is a whole fiction. And yet we hear it so much, and you then start to think, well, maybe there is some truth to it. Maybe I do have to consider it. Maybe there is something about it that makes sense. Well, no, it doesn't. You don't really have to think that hard to recognize that it's ruining everything. And that we don't have a free market anyway. Everything is being gained. <laughs> so media ecology recognizes that some forms of media come to us with more baggage than others. And the internet and all of the electronic gadgets that we have have about as much baggage as anything else mm -hmm. in our information environment. Over time, everything becomes more and more and more refined. Back in the 50s and 60s, people were desperately afraid that the marketers, the ones that are being depicted in Mad Men, today were subverting our minds by putting uh, <laughs> subliminal <coughs> advertising in place that would take us over. Well, that was the same idea as poetry in the ancient Greek era being so powerful that it would transform people and make them into crazy people. We had the same idea about sexuality in the Victorian era with respect to women. It was so powerful that it needed to be shut down. Yeah. Well, there's some truth to that. All those things do have real powerful integral parts and effects on our lives, but we can't control them and we can't um, always insulate ourselves from them either. You have to recognize what they are and how they affect you as best you can in order to nullify their effects, not to shut them out entirely. So when I say that I'm I'm part of the world, I'm part of the dominant uh, culture because I'm adapted for this. This is, this is our current stage of um, development in the world and I can't just simply walk away and become a, a tribesman somewhere. That's not where I come from. Mm -hmm. I can't live off the land. It's not a possibility for me. Besides, the land has been spoiled and it's all owned by somebody. So, you do your best I think to try and make sense of the world, and my speech was one attempt to demonstrate that we're doing pretty badly at it because we're living with these mental categories and giving them far more power over us than any real understanding that comes through the body, that comes through emotion, that comes through experience, which is the only way we can experience the world. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all. all right. And I hope to see you in the new year. Yeah. And, and happy here. solstice and a happy new year to yeah. everyone. Yeah. Yes, all right. Not, not sanity, right? Instead of the